Welcome to another edition of Sparky Help. This time, the easy guide to the motor effect F equals B I L, the force on a conductor. How do we go about doing this? Let's look at the magnetic field, and it's all about the flux density. Flux density we have looked at in a previous video, so maybe take a look. Where B is the letter to use equals the flux density, which is measured in Tesla or Weber's per meter squared. What are we on about? Well, here's a particular magnet, and the lines represent the flux lines, and as we know, these flux lines are assumed to travel from north to south. There we have a number of flux lines on a given size of magnet. Here's another magnet. Magnet is exactly the same size, but there's fewer flux lines. Therefore, the flux density, i.e. the number of flux lines per metre squared, would be higher on the one on the left hand side. Obviously, the Earth is a large magnet. But why do we not go to the North Pole and find lots of metal stuck to it? Well, because there are way more flux lines than obviously from these two examples here. However, it is huge. It's over a much more vast area. Therefore, its flux density is reasonably low. Remember, if you can condense this down the Earth down to the size of a tennis ball, then the flux density would be incredibly high. Flux density is what we're after. Now let's take a look at a magnet and we split it so we have a north on one side and a south on the other. If we understand this basic principle, the flux lines will just travel the easiest possible path through the air and they will travel from north to south. Flux lines, remember, do not want to cross or touch. And if we swap the poles around, therefore the flux lines will travel the opposite direction in the straightest possible line between the north and the south. And then what have we got to look at? Let's have a look at a conductor. If we have a conductor and we pass current through it, it will get hot. We probably recognise this. What we show here, we tend to show it as a representation, as a cross section. So we're looking end on on the conductor. And this is a circle, as we see on the screen. There's nothing passing through it, no current. So therefore, we don't represent anything. And therefore, being a copper cable or an aluminium cable, it possesses no magnetic properties whatsoever. However, as we put current through it, and we represent it by a cross as current going in, and there's the current going up, the magnetic field around it gets stronger. And it's concentric. It goes round in circles. And think of it like a posi drive screw. You're screwing into the wall, so righty tighty, lefty loosey, so we're turning it in a clockwise direction, and the flux lines will go round the cable. Remember, they will not touch. So they will expand and contract as the current changes. Let's look at that again, but this time the current is coming towards us, so it's going the opposite direction, and the same will apply. But the flux lines this time travel in an anti-clockwise direction. So another way to look at this is if you was throwing a dart away from you, you would see a cross, you'd see the flights. And if the person, if you did happen to throw it at somebody, what they would see would be this thing here. It's coming towards you. And if you was unscrewing out of the wall, it would be in an anti-clockwise direction. This is important to recognise. Now here we got a magnet, try to throw it as 3D as possibly I can, and we got a north and a south. And if we put a conductor in the middle, we have flux lines which would go north to south, as shown there. And then we put a conductor in it, and it's the length of the conductor that we are interested in that is within the magnetic field. So here we have a conductor, and as you can see, it is bigger than the magnetic field, but the bit we're only interested in is the the amount of conductor that is affected by the magnetic field. So it's just this length here, which we measure in meters. So there we've got the length. Now, if we put a conductor inside this, then, so there's a conductor inside a magnetic field between north and south. No current is passing through the conductor, so it has no magnetic field, and therefore the flux lines will just pass through it from north to south. However, this time we'll put a conductor in and we'll put current through it and it will go in a clockwise direction. 
and I'll just show one going round for the moment. And then we've got our flux lines. Our flux lines, remember, do not want to cross or touch other flux lines. So all they want to do is go from north to south. And it's a bit like a whirlpool, so they're spinning round in a clockwise direction. And the other flux lines get dragged round with them, and they will all take the route around trying to avoid each other. So you get the flux lines looking like this. Now what does this do? Well, those flux lines, if you think of them like elastic band, they want to go straight. So what they will do is push the conductor, if it can move, down. So it has a force on the conductor in a downwards direction, which we can measure in newtons. Obviously, if the conductor stayed still, then the magnet would try to move, but that's normally the conductor we want to move. Now we have exactly the same again, but this time the current is going in the opposite direction. So remember, it's going anti-clockwise. All the flux lines wants to do are travel north to south. Now, when they want to go north to south, they will get dragged round again. Think of it again like a whirlpool. They will get dragged around it, so this time they get dragged down. This time the force being exerted is an upwards direction, which again we measure in newtons. Change the poles of the magnets this time, i.e. current going into the, the screen as it were, going in a clockwise direction, and they're dragged round, and this time the force is going up. And if we put it round the other way again, then the force will go back down. So, providing you change one, and it can be the poles of the magnet or the current through the conductor, the force direction will change. And we have a downwards force on this. Now, what's the length got to do with it? Well, here we have a coil. So, to get more length of the conductor within it, what they do is they coil it round. So, rather than have one conductor in, because as you can probably imagine, the force on that conductor would be relatively low. So if you wrap it round maybe 20, 30, 40, hundreds of times, then you end up with more conductor within the magnetic field, providing the current goes the same direction. And then how does this work on motors? Well, what they do, there's the winding. So you have one coil looped round, and that comes out to something called a commutator, which is just basically, in this case, the most simplest we've got, is two half segments of which we can now connect a battery to that, i.e. DC, and we connect the so. And how they would connect onto this commutator, which rotates, which would be uh, able to spin because it's got bearings, you put carbon brushes onto them, which make contact with it. So for older drills you may have seen on the back, when it spins you see arcing in the little grills at the back, what you're seeing is the carbon brushes wearing down onto the commutator. And if we apply current, then current will flow through this conductor. In and out and around we go, so we've got current in either direction. Now, just as a simpler version of that, this is basically what we're looking at. So current going in on one side of the loop as a cross section and back out. So how do you think? the magnetic field from north to south, which is a fixed magnetic field, would interact with this one. Remember, flux lines cannot cross or touch. So let's have a little look. It would do this. It would wrap round, and I'm only showing a few, but you get the idea. So hopefully what you can see with a pivot in the middle, there are two forces being exerted. One is pushing up and one is pushing down. And because it's on a pivot in the middle, it would rotate. Now you can normally tell when people are on this type of exam question because you see them holding their hands up and trying to put their fingers up like so. So this is a motor, so we use our left hand. And the right hand is used for generators, generator, left hand for motors. And you've basically got your first finger and your second finger at 90 degrees as shown, and your thumb points in the upwards direction. And the thumb, which has an M in it, is the motion. The first finger is the magnetic field. And the second finger, which has got a C in it, 
is the current direction. So all of those are held at 90 degrees as such. And if we put those in, if you hadn't already figured out by just deducing what would happen, understanding the basic principles, we can work out the direction. So current is coming towards us. And the magnetic field is going north to south. It's going left to right. Therefore, hopefully what you would see, as you see there, the thumb, the motion would be going up. And you can use this, you can use your fingers, but if you understand the basic principles, just by look, looking how you think the interaction between the fluxes would work, you can figure it out logically anyway. But yes, this is a handy method for finding direction. And there's the force being exerted. How can we apply this then back to the formula? F equals B I L. So that's what we've got, what we just explained. And there we've got our currents and our magnetic fields and our length. A triangle, this does work in a triangle. F over B, I, L, cover any one of those up. And therefore, if you want to find I, it would be F divided by B times L. If you want to find L, F divided by B times I. Always the best thing to do is write the formula out and highlight what is relevant in the question. Sometimes they give you information that is not relevant. So there we've got our formula. What's it trying to work out? Well, they're asking to work out a force, so it's got to be a straightforward B, I, L. Therefore, we put the numbers in 1.1, making sure the units are correct. 5 amps is the current, and it, the length is in meters, so it just becomes 0.8. So it gives us 4.4 newtons of force on this particular conductor. Let's look at another. There we got our triangle F is over B I L. Well, we don't have to do much transposition for this one because it's just a straightforward. However, the point to note out on this one is that the length of the conductor is in millimetres and it needs to be in metres. Everything else can stay the same. So 2.8 times 11 times 0.6. And that gives us 31.4 newtons of force. So hopefully that's relatively straightforward. Let's have a look at another one. So we've got the force, we need the flux density. This is a rearranger formula. So we've got our original formula, F equals B I L. And if we apply the triangle, it becomes B is equal to F divided by I times L. So we've got 15 divided by I, which is 13, times by L, which is 0.95. And it doesn't matter what order you put it in. I have to put it around a different way there. I've just noticed. And when you work that out, it becomes at 1.21 Tesla or Weber's per metre squared. Either is acceptable, but be aware that they are the same. And as you can see, the triangle would have been helpful if you can't remember. OK, this is Sparky Help. I hope this has been useful. Thank you very much.